I love toes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> boys and girls, welcome to episode 313 of the Spearhead Sundays podcast. Keelan loves toes. You heard it here first. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's, it's a great day, okay? It's a really good day. Today, I was on holiday recently, yeah. and uh, I, I did the, mo- the, the, the funniest thing. So I was on holiday in this, uh, in this place uh, in, in Joanna, right? It's, it's basically as close as you can get to Tasmania without getting on a boat from the mainland. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we're there, and it's a, uh, we go to this, um, me and my dad are sta- standing in a cabin, and we go to the local like uh, coffee shop to get uh, like a sausage roll, some food, and before we go to the beach. And I'm there, and uh, a whole school excursion <laughs> rocks up. Yeah, and in, like an entire school. I think uh, they must have been like 12, 13. So what's that? Grade five and six. I think seven and seven. I think I uh, maybe it was high school. I don't know. It could have been like the end of primary school, the start of high school, right? So whole class, and they're all giving me the the look. Uh, and I've noticed what I've noticed actually. This is a bit of a tangent, but what I've noticed since the surgery is people are so unsure that it's me because I look so different, mm. right? So before people would just know it's me straight away when I get noticed. I would have very few. Are you or are you not? And that's like usually from like people who aren't like mega fans, but who have seen like a few of your videos or something. Uh, they would know who I am. They get, they might, they might not know my name, but they'll go, "You're that guy." Now, everyone that comes up to me, pretty much, is is really unsure because I definitely look like me, but I also really don't. <laughs> so I don't look like the guy they've seen online. So these kids are staring at me, and uh, and and you know, when you've been doing this for a while, you know when people are noticing you. But I let people say hi. I don't go up to them and I certainly don't go up to children. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to be like, hey, kids, you guys are looking at me. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that <laughs> happens. And then eventually one brave kid comes up and goes, are you this person? I go, yeah, that's me. And then I get swarmed by every kid and I'm waiting for my large cappuccino. Uh, and these kids, they surround me and they're talking to me, blah, blah, blah. And then they go, can we get a photo? I'm like, yeah, of course. But then they go, we don't have phones, <laughs> right? Because the, the, and how fucking sad is that? That to take kids on a school excursion, you have to confiscate their phones. Yeah. Like it, where we were was beautiful. And the cafe that we were at is like a tourist attraction. There's heaps of these massive Australian king parrots. They're huge. They're almost as big as cockatoos. They're big fat parrot things, all hand tame. So the thing is you go there and then you go on the porch and you hand feed them. And it's beautiful. Whereas if you took all those kids there, they would just be fucking looking at their phones, doing not even acknowledging the fact that they're on holiday somewhere or on school excursion. Uh, so I think it's really funny that the teachers had to be like, all right, kids, we're going to go and see the one of the most beautiful sights in the world. Give me your fucking phone. So somewhere at, at that cabin, there's about 60 phones locked up. That's a good hustle. Anyone out there who knows uh, a bunch of campsites that do school excursions, Every every uh, every term near, towards the end of term, break into cabins until you find the one that has 180 smartphones <laughs> just in a duffel bag and run. That's a good one. But anyway, these kids, they all come up to me and no one has a phone. They all want a photo. So uh, they bring over one of the teachers and the teacher takes a photo and, uh, and I'm like, okay, cool. I got to get out of here because everyone's staring at me. I'm surrounded by kids. This is a bit strange. Uh, so I... Uh, this. This guy just puts giant cup on top of the coffee machine. I grab that and I go, all right, kids, have a good excursion. I'll see you later. Me and dad exit the building. And I, as soon as we get in the car and I take a sip, I stole one of the kids drinks. (laughs) Like it's just a massive hot chocolate. (laughs) I thought it was a coffee. It's just a hot chocolate because the kids were there before me. So just some poor kid has used his pocket money and they've gone, oh, I saw this fucking comedian. I took a photo with him and then he fucking (laughs) robbed me. He stole my drink and left the cafe. That's really funny. Either that's happened or some kid is waiting for their hot chocolate and they get on the school bus. They're drinking my massive coffee. They're going to be bouncing off the fucking walls and shitting themselves halfway to the mountain or whatever they're going to see. So... 
if I robbed you while you're on school excursion, I'm sorry. But also I'm not because the hot chocolate was delicious. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yum. Really good stuff. So I hope the, I hope the kid wasn't drinking from it. I don't think so. It was it was a freshie. Um, so that was that was a bit of fun. Um, Matt Reif is in a lot of trouble. Mm. The comedian Matt Reif, he's blown up on TikTok. Uh, he's the unbelievably handsome crowd work guy. He's got something insane, like 17 million followers just on Instagram. I think he has a few million on, uh, sorry, 17 million just on TikTok. I think he's got a few million on Instagram and then another few million on YouTube. Like the guy is unbelievably massive. I don't think we've ever seen a comedian become this famous this fast in the history of comedy ever. Mm. And it's all through just crowd work clips, which as we know is the meta right now, popularized by Andrew Schultz uh, and others. But he's the he's like the guy that has really perfected it. And he's in a lot of trouble at the moment because he just released a comedy special on Netflix. And a lot of people are very unhappy with not just the jokes that he's told, but also the response to the criticism for the jokes that he told. And I figured I would talk about it because I'm obviously one of the um, the best positioned to speak about this as a recently handsome comedian. Mm-hmm. Because obviously Matt Reif, if you look at photos of him from the early days, he was an ugly boy, but he became really handsome. You look at photos of me from the early days, I was an ugly boy. I recently became even more handsome than Matt Reif. I think we can all agree. <laughs> like I, I haven't posted a crowd work clip since the, uh, the surgery, I'm telling you, when I film that first show and I get a crowd work clip, people are going to, uh, like, I'm, I'm getting to 18 million followers, all right? TikTok's going to delete Matt Rife's account when they see my jawline. Isn't that frustrating that that I'm the one that had the, that the incredibly intensive major double jaw surgery and that is still much more attractive? <laughs> <laughs> I want my money back! This is bullshit! It's not fair. And you know what is even more frustrating? He was uglier than I was. <laughs> so what? what's going on? Give me Matt Rife's surgeon. He's There's, just been mewing. Yeah, he's been mewing. That's <laughs> that's where I went wrong. He got, uh, I don't know if he had, I don't think he had jaw surgery. He definitely got new teeth because mm. his teeth were really bad and he has like real nice American smile. Um, I think he just put on a lot of weight. I think he just went to the gym and got new teeth and then grew into his face but then there are a lot of people going like oh do you really think this guy went through puberty at 27 <laughs> i don't know all i'm saying is uh i i know that i w- that i would be um all i'm saying is is i'm i think that i'm not as handsome as i would like to be because no one is really accusing me of getting this just for cosmetic reasons everyone's like yeah man good on you i'm glad you're healthy it's like yeah but aren't i also like really sexy <laughs> fuck um but anyway into the controversy, he's gotten into a lot of trouble because uh, on his Netflix uh, special that just came out, he starts his show with a joke about domestic violence. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to butcher it if I reference it, but it's something, something along the lines of he's at this, he's in a horrible area, like a really rough area. He's talking about violence there already. And it's a really rough area. He goes into like a diner and he gets served by a woman with a black eye and he feels sorry for her and he goes, oh, um, his friend goes, oh man, maybe they should keep her back in the kitchen. And he goes, oh, well, if she, if she was in the kitchen, she wouldn't have the black eye. Like, uh, you know, if she knew how to cook, she, if she knew how to eye. cook. She wouldn't have a black eye, which is like, it's, yeah, it's kind of, it's, I don't know, it's, it's an all right joke. It's not super hilarious, but it is more of like a, a, a litmus test for the crowd of like, I'm going to go dark on this one, or I'm going to push the boundary a little bit. Uh, and so Matt Reif, his audience are women, like huge, giant proportion of his audience are chicks. And he said this as well. He said that for for a really, really long time, 90% of his in-person audience, the people that bought tickets, women. And it's only been like slightly recently that some men are attending and a lot of those men are boyfriends. So he's like a woman's comic. So a lot of women are disappointed by this joke because it's it's at the expense of a of a horrible issue that that mostly affects women some men as well but it's mostly women um and he responded to this criticism right now i didn't laugh very much at the dv joke 
I almost cried at his response to people complaining about it. So he puts out his special. It starts with a domestic violence joke. Huge controversy ensues. And he posts on his Instagram story a nice photo of him performing stand-up with a link. And he says, if anyone is, off is, is offended by the special, uh, hit this link. I tap on the link and it just takes you to a store that sells helmets for special needs people. <laughs> <laughs> and I lost it. That's a good one. I wasn't so sure about the initial joke. Not because I was offended by it. I just thought it was kind of obvious. The special needs one, that's my bag. I like that. That's very funny. And people have lost it even more. Everyone's, uh, uh, all I'm seeing on Twitter is people just hating on Matt Rife, saying that he's a piece of shit for not just the initial joke, but for also doubling down on it and, and this new joke. Um, and uh, I, I think it's really interesting because I think that he's doing it on purpose. Uh, and I, I don't know, it'll be interesting to see if it plays out to be the right move. Because I think what's happening is, uh, if, you just, if you just put aside, let's imagine Matt Raff's a business, right? He's completely cornered his market. Like the demographic that uh, he naturally attracts, he's dominated it, right? He's just women. He's young women, they love him. There's no real room for growth there. He's done it, he's conquered it. The only audience that he wasn't really touching is men, specifically like 18 to 30 year old men. A lot of dudes do like him and a lot of dudes do find him funny. But when you do look at Matt Rife, you think for girls. So it seems like if he, if, let's just imagine that he's, he, this is a business decision. It seems like he's gone, all right, my growth here is done to continue growing. I need to attract a brand new type of customer and I know that they like this type of stuff. And he's done a lot of interviews um, as well that I've watched. I've watched a lot of his interviews because it's. I'm, I'm just fascinated by his business and how he's been able to grow. It's like truly, you've never seen anything like it before. You almost haven't seen it in any entertainment field at all. Like maybe some musicians have blown up on TikTok the way that he has, but even then, I don't know if they're selling tickets like he is, you know, like I think he, he sold something. I might get the number wrong, but I think it was like 400,000 tickets. Uh, that might be very wrong, but it was like in a day, it was like something ridiculous. You might have to fact check me on that, but uh, he's done a lot of interviews talking about how uh, he has done shows and the problem the the amazing benefit of crowd work clips is it shows off your comedic ability, but it doesn't burn your material. When you're a stand-up comedian, once you, it, it takes months sometimes to write like three minutes because you have to test it, you have to try it out. And every time you test it, you got to chop and change it until it's perfect. And then your joke is done. And then you might have a tour that goes on for a year. If you post that joke that you, you spent months writing, if you post it online, you can't do it again. You can't perform it live. People have seen it. It's not like music where if you spend months writing your song, you put it on the album and then people want to hear it again and again and again. Jokes don't work like that. So you can't release your material until the tour is over. But even when the tour is over, if you want to record a comedy special, you can't release those jokes either. So say you might spend two years touring one show. The big comics do it for two years. And then if they were to release that show online, now they can't do a special because they have no material. So you have to, material is like precious. It's like gold. So crowd work, it's pretty much the only thing that you can release regularly that will never happen again. Like I'm never going to talk to that specific electrician ever again uh, who's ha sitting in the front row. And if I, even if I do, the conversation will be different. So I can just release that if it's funny and it will get my name out there. It will show people that I'm funny. And when they come to the show, they won't see that again. So they'll be like, oh man, I got, I got what I paid for. Um, so that's the benefit of it is it, it showcases your ability to be funny without ruining uh, the show for people who would buy tickets. The negative side of it is, uh, sometimes people think that's what your show is. Like that's the, the whole show is just you talking and freestyling, which it rarely ever is like crowd work. I don't know when, when a comic is really, really on fire out of an hour show, 
they might do 10, maybe 15 minutes of crowd work. Like, and that's heaps. Sometimes it's more, like I've done full shows where I wasn't feeling it. So I've done no crowd work or I've tried to do crowd work and it hasn't really worked out. So we maybe we've got a good minute and a half. And then I've done some shows where I've done like 30 minutes because I was just on a fucking roll. But like as a, a, a standard, maybe like 10, 15 minutes. And when you do crowd work and you post it online, I remember talking to Andrew Schultz about this back in 2019. Uh, he and I were complaining that sometimes people show up to the shows to get into the clip. They want to be part of the clip. Uh, and that never works because if, if you're talking to someone who's like trying to make the clip, it's fake, it's unnatural, it's weird. So I think with Matt Rife, he's done so brilliantly these crowd work clips and has blown up like that, that people kind of, the reason why he's gotten in trouble is people expect one thing from him and they received another because, you know, people don't know him for his material and it's pretty hard to do really dark crowd work because it's pretty rare that you talk to someone about a really dark subject when you're doing crowd work. Like if, uh, if you have a brilliant joke about domestic violence, right, that you've written and it's genuinely funny, you can say that, but it's unbelievably rare that you would talk to someone in the front row and they would open up about their experience with that and then you would be quick enough on your feet and sensitive enough to tell a few jokes. So I think that what has happened is, you know, generally when you do crowd work, it is lighter. It is like a lot more relatable. It is uh, friendly uh, and it is a lot more, um, a, a lot less like brutal and edgy because that's just the nature of the conversations that you have. Sometimes some crazy things happen. Like I've, I've spoken to like trans people and we've gotten into some really deep stuff that's like, you know, really heavy, but also really funny, but that's super fucking rare. Mm. So that I think that is, yeah, often the issue with crowd work is that when that's the only thing that you're posting, sometimes your crowd work is completely different from your material because you're just bouncing off like a stranger that is so completely unlike you, the performer, that's where the funniness uh, lies. So I think that uh, what's really interesting about this is because, you know, Matt Rife's had his big Netflix moment, his audience is going to check out his material and a lot of them are really shocked that that's what his material is. Mm. Um, but I think that this is good for Matt Rife. It could be good, it could be bad. I think that what he's trying to do, again, going back to the business analogy, I think that he's trying to appeal to a new audience, an audience that he wasn't really touching or appealing to naturally through his crowd work. His material will catch that. However, it is going to alienate a lot of his core audience, which is pe like girls on TikTok who are watching him. They think he's really cute and handsome and they're kind of projecting this idea of him onto him. They see him in his nice outfits and he looks really handsome and he looks like a sweet, cute boy and he's talking to girls in the crowd and he's really open and playful and fun and sweet and nice, but really funny. And so they think that this guy could never write jokes about things that I might feel uncomfortable about, but that's not what's happened. Uh, he's, he, you know, I just think that it's a really interesting reaction. And, and I think it's, it's really says so much about how, we can project onto people that we like or people that we think we know, I think is, is, is the, the big re the big negative reaction is not just, Oh, you're a piece of shit for making these jokes. The, the big negative reaction is I'm disappointed in you. Mm. And that means that I thought you were here, but you're actually there. And it's like, well, why did you think he was here? Did you, ever watch any of his material? Cause he has a few comedy specials on YouTube that are quite funny. Are these people that are upset and angry and disappointed in him? Did they ever watch the material? Uh, if the answer is no, those people probably weren't going to see a show because you would think that if you're the type of person to buy a ticket to the guy's show, you would make the effort over to YouTube and watch the free 40 minute comedy special that he's put out there. So if he does burn these people, I don't think it'll be bad for business. I think it'll be good because you are actually seeing 
uh, a huge reaction to uh, this controversy and his refusal to apologize and even, you know, pushing back and pushing even further as his response. You're seeing, like I see on Twitter, on uh, Instagram, on TikTok, I'm seeing uh, a really, really hugely negative response, but I'm seeing a huge, nah, fuck them, I like this guy now from an entirely new demographic of dudes, if we're being real, it's just guys who never didn't dislike him, but looked at him and saw his fans and were like, oh, that's not for me. Clearly, this isn't being marketed towards me. Now it is. So it's a, it, I think it'll be a really interesting to see it, how it plays out. And I think it will play out really well. Mm. I mean, it's, it's yeah, just an, a really loud uh, vocal minority of people who probably if they went to a show would fucking hate it obviously because they're seeing his material and they're hating it um so i guess we'll see how it plays out in the long term but i think i think it will play out really well for him um but another interesting take i saw from uh, anthony jesselnick of all people and i don't know if he was specifically talking about matt rife you know how on tiktok people post clips from like five years ago and kind of imply that the person is talking about current event. Yeah. And people go, oh my God, when did he say this about this other celebrity? And it's like, dude, this is from five years ago. This person wasn't even a celebrity when that person was talking about this issue where they happen to converge on. But Anthony Jesselnik was, was talking about this. He said something really interesting. He, he was quoting um, Andy Warhol. He said, uh, uh, an artist's job is to get away with it. Um. And he was talking about, and Anthony Jeselnik is like the dark comic. Like he's the guy. It's like him and Jimmy Carr are like when you think of like really dark humor jokes about heinous topics, you really do think those two people. Uh, but he said something really interesting. He, he, he was talking about how the artist's job is to get away with it. And he said that a lot of comedians, and I do think this is true, a lot of comedians will uh, go out there and they'll talk about getting canceled uh, and, they'll, and they'll talk about backlash as if it's like a badge or something to be proud of, or or um, even worse than that, they'll go out there and they'll try to get cancelled, or they'll talk about, I am trying to offend people, or I am trying to make people hate me, I'm trying to get cancelled. But that's kind of a shit comedian. That's a, that's a comedian that, uh, like your, your goal, first and foremost, should be to make people laugh, to to do jokes about darker things and get away with it, to do these jokes and be like, ah, yeah, but it's fine because it was so funny or because it was, uh, it showed understanding. Um, and I, I think that's true. I think that to push back a little bit on that though, is like, it is also inevitable to piss people off. Like it's, it's especially when you're joking about darker things and, and things that Jesselnik has talked about a lot uh, in his shows. It's like, it's, it's absolutely inevitable to piss people off. Um, like this guy, Anthony Jesselnik got a whole TV show uh, pretty much canceled for celebrating a dude who was eaten by a shark like the week it happened. And I, I thought it was funny, but, it, but also so many people would not. Like so many people get angry at that. Um, but I think I think it, I think it all goes back to like your intention should always be to make people laugh. Like first and foremost, like that's the goal. Like I am actually never happy when people are offended. Like I don't like that. I understand that it's that it's an an, an inevitable part of what I do, uh, and and what every comedian does is is it doesn't really it really doesn't matter how silly your jokes are. Someone's going to get their feelings hurt, but. I don't think that should ever be the goal. I think a lot of comedians, especially the younger ones and especially the ones who see like, you know, the power of being quote unquote canceled. Uh, it's a marketing tool. And, and, and I think they'll see that and they'll go, Oh, I'm going to try and offend people. And it's like, no nah, man, like you're a comedian. You should try to make people laugh. And then offended people are kind of like an unfortunate casualty. It's never something that I'm excited about. Like when I got protested, I was like, this is great PR. It sucks that they're so upset. Like, I don't, I don't like that. It sucks that they couldn't uh, understand or see my side. And, and I had a look at the jokes that I told and I was like, oh, are they, were they just fucked? And I was like, no, I'm, I think that I'm in the right here. I think they're fine. Um, 
but yeah, I think that's a that also is a really interesting point where you I think that as a comedian you can go too far on the edgy side of things and like really pushing I push the boundaries and I'm a dark comedian and I'm super edgy and it's like you can do those things and you can be edgy but like you have to be funny. You ha- like that's a non-negotiable because otherwise you're just going to go up there and if you really want to be a super dark edgy comic just go up there and blackface and say slurs. Mm. Like then you're really pushing the boundaries and and offending snowflakes. Uh but are you being funny? Um and I say that as someone who has used controversy so much uh, in my career and, and has have actively stoked it as well. Like I've done this, but I've only ever done it as a secondary. It's, it's always, always, always been my priority to write the best, funniest, most well-written jokes that I possibly can. Uh, and, you know, even, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm still learning and I'm still trying to do that. And I still, I still feel like my taste is so much further ahead of my ability of like, I want to be here, but I'm currently here. And I, I don't think you really, really get good at comedy until you're in your fifties. You look at the goats, it's like Bill Burr, Louis CK, Dave Chappelle, uh, Joan Rivers was at her funniest when she was like fucking 70 <laughs> rolling around on stage. Her bones were falling off her body, you know? Um, so I think, I think that the, it it is a really interesting thing because, um, people are so upset at Matt Reif, right? Or, or a a minority of people are very upset at Matt Reif, but I would kind of ask the question of what is the alternative for him? So either he can just because you never want to be like beholden to your audience. You never want to be held hostage as an artist. This goes for all art forms, mu- music, this or that. I mean, Andre 3000 just released, he's the greatest, one of the greatest rappers of all time. And he just came out and was like, fuck it, I'm releasing an album where I play the flute, no vocals. <laughs> you know, and, and a lot of people are angry and upset about that. But it's like if, if he was scared of his audience, he would just create shit, dis, disingenuous rap that he didn't care about he was he was only making it to appease fans Mm. uh or to not get in trouble for for pushing himself creatively so the alternative for matt rife is is he has this huge massive blow up moment he gets his netflix special and he thinks what are young girls on tiktok going to enjoy i need to write jokes for that audience but if you're writing material like that, like before you even write a joke, you're thinking, what are girls going to like or what are African-Americans age 35 to 55 going to enjoy? Like if you're thinking about demographics and types of people before you even start writing anything or the commercial viability or if you're going to offend or if people are going to like it, you're not going to write anything and what you do write is going to suck. Um, so the alternative would would be for him to release like a really – boring comedy special of material that's been like vetted by demographics and made to appeal for an audience that he's already completely won over and already hitting. And I would argue that if he ticked all of these boxes that all these people are upset at him for not hitting, the guy would probably just get panned for releasing a boring special. Like, ah, we've, it's better on TikTok. We've seen this. Which is what happened. He's TikTok has been panned and criticized for being boring. Yeah. Yeah. Like you got to You have to evolve and you have to, you have to push yourself and you have to, you know, expand creatively. And the guy is still like for a comedian, he's young as fuck. And he's only recently become this unbelievably famous. Like I was, I saw, I screenshotted it. It was so inspiring when his Netflix special came out, he posted a, a screenshot of his, of an Instagram story from an archive. You know, when you, you can go into your archives and you look at your, your stories that you've posted on Instagram. 18 months ago, he took a photo of a crowd. It was like maybe 60 people, empty seats fucking everywhere, having a great time, but he would be making no money, (laughs) you know? And I saw that and I was like, that is the most beautiful, inspiring thing to see how this dude has completely changed the entire trajectory of the rest of his life in 18 months by posting just crowd work clips or just stand up clips. Um, and yeah, I just, I just think that this, this crazy, huge, intense backlash is 
from people who, yeah, I mean, if they were to attend his shows, wouldn't like it anyway. So he is going to lose probably a really big chunk of his current crowd. But I think he's those people would never have liked him. And also a lot of people that I'm seeing criticize him are saying shit like, I knew there was a reason why I didn't like him. And that is the lamest shit ever. And I keep, I'm seeing that more and more and more whenever someone blows up, especially when they blow up in a quick amount of time or if they're like a recently famous person, people are just like waiting to, to, to take it away from them. They're waiting for that controversy. They, they hate them and they're looking for a reason. It's like, I fucking hate you and I can't wait to find out why. It's like, if you don't like someone and it's, and you don't know why, like you're actually a really shit person. Like, I, do you hate their success? Do you hate that they're happy and you're not? Like the problem lies within your soul. If you're the type of person to look at someone who's successful and you dislike them before you even understand why, it's like, that's not, that's not what a, a well-functioning, well-balanced human does. You're the piece of shit in this scenario. I knew it. I knew they were a bad person. I hated them for 18 months and finally I have a reason, which is just like them going, oh, finally, I don't have to feel like an asshole for disliking this person. Mm. It's like, that's such a weird, a weird thing to celebrate is yes, a controversy. I have a reason to hate them now instead of going, I don't like them. Why? I don't know. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think, I just think it's, it's, really interesting i'll be very interested to see how it pans out but but i i can't see it going poorly i think it's 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 the best thing possible that could have happened because when you get, get when you get the netflix special like when you are uh, an entertainer that gets like the opportunity of, if you're a musician maybe it's getting a grammy or whatever like all of your fans who already like you who you've already sold are like so super proud of you that uh the only way to kind of grow beyond that and get even more eyes on the achievement, releasing the album, releasing the Netflix special, celebrating the award, the TV show, the movie, the whatever it is, is getting people who don't either don't know who you are or do know who you are, but aren't sold on you yet is getting those people to, to pay attention. And with, you know, usually to get more eyes, controversy, there's no such thing as bad press. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I'm talking about it. Everyone's talking about it. And it's and it's just making a bunch of people like all of these, even all these TikToks that have like millions of views that are trashing the guy. The comment section is full of never heard of him. I have to watch it now. Never liked him, but I do now. Or, um, oh, I, I've got to check it out. And, and that's great for Netflix. They're going to look at the numbers and be like, holy shit, we've got one. We've got a new guy who can actually get uh, people to move from one platform to ours and watch the thing, even if it's only for 20 minutes and then they hate it and they turn it off. That's a huge win for Netflix. That's a huge win for Matt Reif. And now, you know, he just has more story to talk about. I can probably guarantee you he'll be posting clips responding to this controversy. You know, it, it, it's a machine that, that feeds itself this stuff, especially with comedy. But I do think that uh, it can be really lame to just be like yeah that's right i offended people and that was my goal it's like that should never be the goal as an entertainer like that i think it's really weird when comedians do it and it, that would be like when a, a musician puts out an album and is like i hope people fucking hate it it's like no you don't you want you want people to like it you know it's just uh an an amusing um uh collateral damage when someone's offended by a joke. It's kind of how I think about it of like, oh, that's a shame that that not only you didn't find it funny, but it actually hurt your feelings. That's never something that I'm like proud of, but I do understand that it is inevitable, especially when you're playing with like the more dark, uh, dangerous stuff that I like writing about. But um, yeah, I don't know. Those are my thoughts. I'd love to know what you guys think about this whole controversy. Do you have, what do you think about it? I don't think the joke was that bad and people are taking it out of proportion. Uh, there was a joke. I don't remember what it was because I watched it on Sunday. There was a joke probably 15 minutes after that one that was kind of edgy that yeah. no one's talking about. Yeah. That when I was watching it, I was like, oh, that is a, that's edgy. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily good, but it's funny what people take away from yeah. it. Yeah. What people decide to get offended by. 
And 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 also no one else is. Sorry, go on. It's a really boring special. It looks boring. He's yeah. boring. Yeah. But nothing against him, but mm. it's a boring. Just not your type special. of guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I uh, I just had this thought now listening to you say it is I wonder how much of this controversy is just because it was in the first 10 minutes. Like I really wonder if he took that very same joke and put it towards the end, would anyone have even noticed it? Because uh, yes. as we all know, right, just it doesn't matter what platform you upload, Netflix is the same, whether it's YouTube, TikTok, podcast, whatever, people, the average view time of anything you put out is pretty much 50%. And apparently on Netflix, it's more like 15, 20 minutes. So it, it's a really interesting question of like, are people only really upset because anyone who clicked on it definitely saw that bit? Would it have hit way less hard or had much less controversy if you put it at minute, tw minute 20? And I don't know, 60 to 70% of people didn't even see it. It's an interesting question of like, yeah. that, that matters so much. Like generally when I, when I have, if I have a really dark joke, I probably won't start with it. I'll put it towards the end of the show, kind of build up rapport with the audience. How much of this intensely negative reaction from some people was just because he didn't do the, the, the courtesy rapport of, I'm a silly guy. This is all jokes. Here's some light stuff to start with and then bang, but it's okay because I have 15 minutes of funny ha ha mm. where we got to know each other and you started to like me before I earned the really dark joke. That's an, that's like a, the, uh, another in really interesting thing on just the psychology of comedy. I have so many jokes yeah. where if I had a 10 minute spot, I would never do them because they would bomb. Whereas if I have a 50 minute spot, I would put them at minute 30 and they'll fucking annihilate because I've earned a rapport with the audience and showed them that I'm, this is, this isn't, isn't the only facet of my performance. There's also other silly things. Yeah. It's yeah. The last thing I, I find funny about it is when I, I watched it with a friend, we missed the joke initially yeah. because he, he does like five minutes off the top talking about Maryland and DC, like, mm. cause he's playing in DC. Yeah. And I had to explain to my friend what the joke was because I just happened to understand it. Mm. That's why we missed the, the the joke everyone's upset about. Yeah, I, that's yeah, that is a gripe of mine. Living in Australia, like I don't know anything about Maryland and DC. Like I couldn't yeah. put them on a map. I only Such know DC because Washington DC. I don't. Know, I only really know that because of like movies I've seen that the president's in. <laughs> yeah, and I only understand the joke because I was. I went there last year and stayed with some friends who yeah. live there. And how hyper specific that, that yeah. you had to literally go there to understand a joke that's on fucking Netflix. Yeah. Like I would cut the local references, my dude, unless it's like Texas, you know, everyone yeah. knows cowboy hats and guns yeah. <laughs> or New York rude and rats. <laughs> um, Boring looking special. We, we watch, there's a lot to be said. Like visually, visually. production wise. Yeah. There's a lot yeah. to be said about Chris D'Elia, but we followed up with Chris D'Elia special. And mm. there's a lot of like obvious love and dedication put in the production of his special. It, it's very, it's very interesting how, how different comedy specials can look. Like you can shoot them in arenas. You can, you can shoot a special with 60 people and it can look fucking beautiful. Like I think one of my visually, one of my favorite specials is, um, one of Shane Gillis's special that he that he put on YouTube, I think maybe the first one he put out on yeah. YouTube, it looks like 120 people max. Um, it, it could be more or less, but that's what it looks like. And it, it's a tiny little stage. He can barely move. Looks like he's on a bedroom with a spotlight on him. <laughs> and it looks gorgeous. I love it. it I, watching that made me go, oh, was my first one was in front of 300 people. It made me go, oh, I want to do the next one like small. I would love, I would love 80 to 100 people like that looks so fun. Yeah. Um, and it's also something like intimate uh, about it as well. Like uh, just how close the cameras are and everyone is, it, it makes you feel like you're like, as a viewer watching at home, I enjoyed watching that a lot more than uh, specials that are shot in arenas, which feel very like not personal and very, mm out there but a lot of the time specials are shot in giant theaters because they cost a hundred grand to film so you have to make a hundred grand on the tickets to make no money on the special instead of losing a hundred on filming it but yeah i don't know we should, we should probably move on because we've done fucking 40 minutes on matt rife here <laughs> oh he's so handsome 
Um, but I just thought, yeah, as a recently handsome comedian, I'm the one who's really going to have the take that'll go nuts here. Um, all right. Uh, I... Oh, what else should we talk about here? I've got a bunch of other stand-up stuff. I saw Andrew Schultz. Well, you know what? We're going to save some stand-up stuff for another episode. I don't want to go too behind the curtain here. Um, I wanted to talk about this the the Squid Game show that Netflix has put out. Keelan, you watched the first episode? Well, like 20 minutes of it, yeah. How long are the episodes? An hour? About an hour. About an hour. That's, see, I don't... I, I don't want to watch anything for if it's if it's an hour it has to be a podcast or I it can't hold my yeah. attention I can't watch uh I can barely watch like a really good drama TV series for like thirty minutes I don't have an hour to put into a game show dude but I do think it's really funny seeing everyone be like oh Mr Beast did it it's Boy. like yeah but Mr Beast was was like imitating a Netflix property yeah. like he didn't invent that's like such an interesting weird thing of like oh you're stealing mr beast idea no mr beast is replicating netflix's property that they own and netflix is now coming back and doing it let's be real at least production wise better bigger yeah. budget it's an actual whole season it's not just one youtube video Paste i haven't watched better. it mr beast video genuinely might be better but I think Mr. Beast's video was really badly paced and rushed. Mm. Uh, I thought it was cool when it came out. I think we watched it together. Yes. Uh, this one is cool because you just got kind of get to get to know the contestants a little bit more. And yeah, how, feels, many, how many episodes total is it? I think it's five. Right. And it feels uh, real. Like whenever someone gets out, you can see the devastation in their face. Because how much they're, – they're, they're playing for like the actual amount that in they are. 4.5 million. Million? Isn't it a few hundred thousand? It's millions? Yeah, Might let me check. Let me check. I thought it was 4.5 million. That is insane. Um, but yeah, I do... I do. The, the other thing that people are upset about that I think is, uh, is very funny is... Uh, sorry, to all the video viewers, Bobby has joined yeah. me on the, on the podcast, but it's a little bit different from the other time she's joined me on the podcast because this time she's 42 kilos and she no longer fits on the chair or my lap, but she doesn't know that yet. No one's told it. 4.5 mil. Wow. That's crazy that they have that budget. What was the, what was, what were people playing for in the, the Mr. Beast version? I looked it up. Um, yeah, I think it's fascinating. I'm, I'm also seeing like a lot of people getting very upset about, um, 456,000 for the Mr. Beast one. Oh, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah, because Mr. Beast doesn't have 4.5 mil to blow. <laughs> um, but that's what I found, thought was fascinating of like people going, oh, you missed the point of the of the actual Squid Game show. Like the, the guy that fucking wrote and directed it isn't stoked that he's getting paid again. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, well, look, I think this is a little, a little bit different to the Squid Game show because they're not killing the people. So maybe it's not missing the point of the Squid Game show because they don't get killed. It's not killing poor people who are desperate. It's actually trying to make a little fun, light version of it. Was Mr. Beast missing the point when he did it? It's, I don't know. I think it's really weird. But there's a lot of controversy as well because when they were in production, a lot of people were like passing out because they're in this big warehouse for hours and hours on end mm. and that they weren't good working conditions well they should feel grateful that they weren't getting shot yeah and you know? don't sign up to a fucking reality tv show if you're expecting luxury treatment that's just yeah absolutely stupid. absolutely not like it like often the point of these game shows is tough conditions yeah that's the game like it's oh, so oh it was really hard to win the game and i was sweating a little bit yeah dude because you got to run you yeah. fatty you didn't train you didn't watch the show. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't do a, a go for a few jogs before. Like how 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 much notice would have these contestants had that they were going to be in the show? Uh, Months probably. probably. Do some push ups before you show up, fatty. It was announced two years ago. I think they filmed it at the start of this year, so they had a while. Yeah. Wow. That's uh, yeah. Long that is very though. funny. <laughs> yeah. It is. It is. It is a. That's what I found most surprising about it is obviously they were they were blindsided by how popular Squid Games was. Like no one could have predicted that a foreign language like TV show would have blown up this big. Mm. Um, so they obviously would have been blindsided by like the demand to create a real game version of it. But it does seem like a really long turnaround especially when like you know mr beast did it 
Three weeks. Was it really three I weeks? Think it was something like that. Wow, that's amazing. So, like, yeah, they obviously Netflix, the sets would have been better and it would have been shot a lot better and, and with a bigger budget. But, it, it, you know what? It says a lot about, like, the bureaucracy of entertainment versus just, like, the the hustle, fuck it, we'll make it work of YouTube, mm. uh, that, which is a big reason why new media is just winning, especially TikTok, because, you know, TikTok is, is killing YouTube because you don't have to make a thumbnail. You know, I read, I, I was listening to um, uh, a podcast. I sent it to you, Brittany Broski, talking about uh, yeah. her her gripes with YouTube. She blew, she's Gen Z. She blew up on TikTok, and they were like, "What's your problem with YouTube?" And she said something that blew my mind, but made me go, "She's so right." She she was like, "I got a few problems with YouTube. This is this. Also, it's so stupid how reliant the entire platform is on thumbnails." And I was like, "Oh, that is fucking stupid." Because the, the, the literal reality of every time I make a YouTube video, it kind of doesn't matter how good the quality is uh, of the actual video in terms of getting views. What really matters is the title and the thumbnail. That's the most important thing when it comes to getting eyes on your stuff. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's actually insane that I can make like the best video ever and I can put it on TikTok and on YouTube and the, the quality of the actual piece itself matters more on TikTok than it does on YouTube in terms of visibility because on YouTube, what matters more than what's inside the video is the cover, the thumbnail, the title. And I was like, that's so fucking true. I hate making, I hate the amount of effort that I have to put into thumbnails. Like I've gotten really good at making thumbnails and I hate making them. <laughs> I'm like, mm. I just made this great video. I don't, I don't want to package it nicely, but I guess that's, Everything. It doesn't matter how good your chocolate is. If it has an ugly wrapper on it, no one's gonna um, look at look at it and buy it. Um, all right. What else? Uh, what else has been going on? Uh, the. Do you have any emails? I'm. I may. Let's let's have a look at the the emails. Um, okay. I'll pull it up here. I. Uh, oh, go and check out the um the the Tom and Frenchie podcast. By the way, I'm on there. The the episode with me just came out on their platform. And uh, I told an absolute banger story about my dad sending me dick pics. There's your tease for that. Um, all right, let's pull up these emails. If you want to send an email to the show, send it through to podcast at loosebeers.com. If you have a story you want to tell me, if you, have a, uh, if you need some life advice, uh, if you have a question. Um, okay. <laughs> Here we go. This is a good one. How do I tell my friend to stop joking about killing herself? Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, everyone has that one, mate. Uh, uh, no. Well, well, some people don't have that, mate, anymore. Oh. Uh, hey, Lewis, I've been wondering what to do about this for a while, so I thought, fuck it, I'll send it into to Lewis. Uh, I'll, I'll either get advice or a good laugh. Uh, yeah, that, that really is it. So uh, I'm 17, still in high school, and I have a mate called Sarah who struggles a lot with her mental health. She has a recent diagnosis of bipolar disorder and a history with self-harm and suicide attempts. Now, this all sounds scarier than it is. It's not something that has a daily effect on our friendship, obviously on her though. At the start of this year, to put it bluntly, Sarah tried to off herself. Oh, Jesus. She snuck away towards the train station near our school. Oh, no. I don't know. Yeah, this is really funny stuff, isn't it, Gillen? Uh, I don't know exact details of what she did or didn't do, uh, but blah, blah, blah. Now, now for me, yeah, the real victim. <laughs> now, now that that bullshit's out of the way, whoa, my friend tried to kill himself. <laughs> How annoying is it that they keep talking about it? Would you shush? We've all got our problems. Mum made me a shit lunch for school today. <laughs> no. What are you complaining about? You trying to make a whole fucking carriage of people late for work? Selfish. <laughs> oh, uh, no. Now for me, the day after we realized she was gone and put the pieces together and realized what she was doing, the support teacher and older friend uh, want to help her. Me and her other friends sat on the oval at school for two and a half hours, pretty much waiting to find out if she was dead or not. Oh, oh that's horrific. I'm sorry. That's harrowing. Now, of course, that experience was a lot more traumatic for her than me, but, <laughs> big but, it still affected me greatly, especially because I also struggle with my own depression and mental health. Uh, yeah, like that's that's... That's the horrific reality of uh, of someone who leaves early is just the damage they they leave behind and the pain they leave behind with everyone else. So it's like 
absolutely they're the real like victim or or there there, there is no there's I, that's what annoys me it's like oh i'm the real victim in this it's like that's not even that's not even a really like a true that's not how pain works like when when someone is killed in war they leave behind kids and a wife a lot and parents and stuff like that and like they're also victims so it's like it's very um it's 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 a very unhealthy thing to do uh, it, it, look, it can be really healthy and it can be really unhealthy when, when you have a problem in your life. Um, say you have, you you you've got depression cause your, your girlfriend left you and then, and then you go, Oh yeah, but, but kids in Africa are starving. So I don't have a problem. And it's like, no, you are still sad and you still need to work through that. Yes, it can be good to look at people less fortunate than you and feel appreciative of the things that you do have. That's a really positive, really healthy thing to do. But if you look at people's, uh, if, if you look at people who have worse problems than you and then use that as a tool to dismiss your own feelings and shove them down into a bottle, that's really unhealthy. Pain isn't a competition. And, and there is someone on this planet that has the worst life imaginable, but that doesn't mean it doesn't suck when you stub your toe in the shower, you know? Um, so she goes now uh, of course that experience was a lot more traumatic for her than me but it still affected me greatly especially because I also struggled with my, with my own depression and mental health lately Sarah has been making a lot of jokes about killing herself and while I greatly understand using comedy as a coping mechanism lately I found the joke has really upset me almost sending me back to the day waiting to find out if she was okay I really don't know how to bring this up and talk to her without upsetting her or making her feel guilty that I know she already does or making it about me because it's not. Yeah, that is a, that's a really tough question because, because yeah, everything you said is true. Like it, it would be really uncomfortable to hear her talk about that all the time for you, but it might be really healing for her to joke about it. Like so many people's coping mechanism when something awful has happened to them is to joke about it and to, to laugh about it. I mean, you look at fucking most of the content about like during my surgery process was about how horrible it was and how awful it was. Uh, and that was really helpful for me to find some, some joy in it and some, and some humor in it. Um, that is a tough one. I think the, on, the, honestly, I think the only way to kind of to, to work it out is to, is to, say all of these things to her that you've said to me um, and preface it with, Hey, I want to have a, I want to have a bit of a tough conversation and, and, and I'm worried that uh, about coming across as selfish. Uh, what do you think? I think that's a really good, a good way to start a conversation with someone where you're worried about hurting their feelings is to literally start it with, Hey, uh, I actually don't know how to have this conversation. I've been feeling these things and I'm worried that it's selfish. What do you think? And then you go into, you know, when you tell these jokes, it really triggers me and it puts me back in that place where I was really worried about you. And it also is very upsetting to me because I also have these feelings. Um, because you definitely can't be like, hey, don't ever joke about that. Cause that's like her life. You know, if someone was like, hey, don't fucking tell jokes about being tall. I'd be like, well, that's mm. that's who I am. It's a part of my life. I can't not. Like, it just is. Um, but also, she could be doing it so much because she is trying to ask for help and doesn't know how. Uh, and you won't... That could be true. That could be not true. She could just be joking about it because she... Mm. It, it's a coping mechanism the only way to find out is to have this tough conversation and you might hurt her feelings and she might hurt your feelings. I think that's, um, that's something that, that also is, is, I mean, you're young, you're only like 17. That's something inevitable about having a really close friendship or relationship with like a friend or someone you, uh, uh, you're in a relationship with, or like your parents or your children, you're gonna hurt feelings uh, having tough conversations and the way that a real true friendship is kind of like truly bonded is by, is by working through hurting each other's feelings and pissing people, each other off, not to a toxic level of like, Oh, he hits me, but we have fun together on Fridays, you know, but on, on like, a, Oh, we, we, we had this conversation and, and it was really tough for us, but we figured out how to move forward and, 
how to not hurt each other like that again. And now we're actually closer for it. So that's a really, really tough thing that, that you are dealing with as well, because it is, it is so super easy when, when a friend is struggling to be like, Oh, my feelings actually don't matter because they're the real victim. Uh, and that's so not true. Someone can be going through something absolutely fucking horrible and it can really negatively affect you. Um, but that doesn't make them the villain for affecting you like that. And it also doesn't make you selfish for being affected by someone that you love going through a hard time. Of course it is. It's really, really tough. Like me being super sick was really hard on jazz because I couldn't be like the, 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 a, a really good partner to her because I was so unwell. And we talked about that a lot. And it, uh, and she felt selfish for being affected by it. And I felt selfish for being sick. But both of those feelings of selfishness are like, that's not, that isn't necessarily how you should feel. It's, it's not based in logic, but emotions aren't, it's not a logical realm. You know, facts don't care about your feelings. And it's like, yeah, but like feelings are completely separate from facts and, and they're, and they're a part of you. So to kind of weigh everything up like a, like a math equation of who's feeling more pain in the moment. They're the only ones who matter. That's not how your brain works. Um, so I think, yeah, the, the only way honestly to, to, to figure this out is to have like, you, you got to tell her all, all that shit that you wrote down to me, figure out how to talk about that with her and go and, but just preface it with, uh, Hey, I really don't want to hurt your feelings. And, uh, and I feel really selfish saying these things. I genuinely would like to know your opinion on these feelings that I have. I love you and I, and I want to be your friend and I want to work this out and I'm worried about you. Um, but here is how your pain is affecting me. Um, and as long as you don't make it all about you, uh, and as long as she doesn't make it all about her, you guys will get through it. Um, and if you genuinely try this and you, you think that you've done it really well and you've, you've, you've had the conversation to the best of your ability while being as mindful as possible about her and she responds really, really negatively to it, you might not be able to be friends. Mm. Sometimes you've got to make those, those calls of, of like, uh, yes. Yeah. I don't know. That's, that's what I think. You got to have the, have the conversation. Like everything you told me, you got to tell her and you got just got to, just got to pat it a little bit, preface it a little bit and really listen. Um, and, and try to make yourself feel heard because yeah, it's, I totally get it. Like it's, it's hard seeing someone go through hell. Uh, and it's, and it's, it makes you feel very selfish, uh, for feeling bad when they're the, the real victim, you know, it's, it's, it's so like this when, like, when somebody dies, you know, you, you, the, oh, how could I feel sad when this person who was even closer to them is so much more hurt by it. I feel selfish for crying around them when really that's, uh, that's not how it works because your brain and your emotions don't know that they were closer or they're feeling more pain. It only understands you and what you're experiencing it. And to, 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 to d deny that is really bad and unhealthy for you. And if you just continue to ignore it and go, well, she's a real victim. She's a real victim. She's a real victim. You'll probably go, would you shut the fuck up about the train thing? It's not funny. <laughs> and then, then, then you're the asshole. Then you're the selfish piece of shit. <laughs> so that's my advice. Um, what do you guys think in the, in the comments? Have, has anyone uh, dealt with anything similar? Do you have any uh, opinions or, or um, advice for, for this person and their friend, Sarah? Uh, let them know. Um, all right. Uh, I think we're going to end it there unless you had it, unless you had any thoughts, Keelan. Nope. No. All right. Well, no. thank you. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, subscribe, uh, like the show, uh, rate it on Spotify. Uh, and I'll talk to you guys next Sunday. Uh, we're going to continue over on Patreon. We've got a Patreon exclusive episode that is up right now. Uh, thank you for supporting the show. I'll talk to you guys next Sunday. I hope you have a shit one. Bye.